hello everybody, very good morning to you. The leader of a political party pursued by a mob hurling abuse about the paedophile Jimmy Savile. A scene from our streets last night, Sakir Starmer walked through Westminster. The Prime Minister accused by some of his own MPs of fueling it. We'll ask Labour what they make of it. Joined today also by the Shadow Mental Health Minister, Dr Rosanna Allen Khan, and for the Government, the Minister for Technology, Chris Philp. It is Tuesday, the 8th of February. Fresh pressure on the Prime Minister to withdraw his comments as a mob shouting slurs about Jimmy Savile across the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer. A former Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr Speaker, who spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. It is a ridiculous slur peddled by right-wing trolls. Lengthy discussions, President Putin warns Europe may be dragged into military conflict if Ukraine joins NATO. And here in Kiev, the diplomacy continues to prevent a Russian invasion. President Emmanuel Macron of France meeting his Ukrainian counterpart, President Zelensky. Animal lovers look away now. Deeply sorry, the West Ham United player who's apologised as video emerges of him kicking and slapping his tiny pet cat. Curling Queen will speak to the captain of the gold medal winning Team GB curling team who kept the nation up late at the Winter Olympics 20 years ago as this year's hopefuls try their luck in Beijing. Also on the programme for you this morning. Uh, after her dramas in Vegas, Adele is back at the Brits tonight. We'll tell you why it's all changed for the award categories. And Otter Camp. Why there's a wake-up call for otters as Welsh rivers see an unexpected decline in numbers. Good morning, good morning. Let's get right to it, should we? The Minister, bright and early. Hello. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the programme this morning. I know you're here to talk about online abuse, um, and we will get to that. But first, I want to talk about the abuse of Keir Starmer last night, the Labour leader surrounded mm. by protesters. Let's remind people of what happened. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, no one, uh, least of all an elected member of parliament, least of all the leader of the opposition, should be surrounded by a mob, as we're seeing now on your screen, uh, clearly subjecting him to harassment and intimidation. That has no place in a democracy. And I think all of us across the political spectrum should unreservedly uh, condemn what we saw there. I think the police made a couple of arrests, which I'm, I'm glad to hear. Uh, but no one in public life should face that sort of... Uh, intimidation and harassment at all is completely unacceptable. This is why it happened, Boris Johnson in the House. This leader of the opposition, a former director of public prosecutions, Mr Speaker, he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. He should apologise unreservedly. Well, look, I don't think you can say that's why it happened, because some of the people involved in that... Um, that fracas you showed a second ago. You know that they were saying have, have previously. You know they were talking. Have, have, have previously done similar things to people like Michael Gove and BBC journalist uh, Nick Watt. Did I've they listened to. Jim I've listened. Then? I've no. listened to the whole tape. I've yeah, listened so to the whole I. tape, and they did mention Jimmy Savile. They did mention that. They also mentioned Julian Assange repeatedly. They mentioned uh, COVID. They mentioned the opposition more generally, and so I don't think you can point. Uh, to what the Prime Minister said as the cause of that. You certainly can't blame him for the fact um, that mob were clearly behaving in a totally Should unacceptable way. Should he apologise for what he said? Uh, well, I think what the Prime Minister has done already last week is clarified what he meant. He I'm said glad you that... said that because we've got that. That was in Blackpool. I'm talking not about uh, the leader of the opposition's personal um, record when he was, uh, when he was DPP. Uh, and, and, I, and I totally understand that he had nothing to do uh, personally with those decisions. Goes no way far enough. Yeah, well, I think it does, because it explains that he wasn't suggesting that Keir Starmer personally, individually took the decision on the Jimmy Savile prosecution. But Keir Starmer's own website, Chamber's website, says he was responsible overall for the CPS. And, in fact, Keir Starmer himself apologised for the CPS's failings, just in the same way that the Prime Minister has apologised 
for the failings in number 10 Downing Street in the last couple of years. So I don't think what he said, particularly when clarified in the way that you just demonstrated, uh, means that what he said originally um, was misleading. You certainly can't say that what he said in any way prompted, provoked or justified the harassment and intimidation we saw last night. It is a ridiculous slur peddled by right-wing trolls. He just needs to apologise. Yeah. Well, the suggestion that Keir Starmer personally took a decision on Jimmy Savile is a slur, right, is untrue. Um, Keir Starmer is a, is a decent man who, as uh, director of the CPS, uh, was doing his best. But there were organisational failings at the CPS, which Keir Starmer himself, I think, a few years subsequently um, apologised for. So I think, you know, with that clarification that um, the Prime Minister made a couple of days later, that it is an accurate representation then of what happened. Not according. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't think it in any way justified or provoked or incited the, the terrible and totally unacceptable harassment and intimidation of the leader of the opposition we saw last night. This is not what the Mayor of London thinks, Sadiq Khan said. This is what happens when fake news is amplified and given uh, credibility by people who should know better, but not just him, Nicola Sturgeon, saying um, if he has any decency at all, the PM will now apologise unreservedly, and Sir Ed Davey saying the fact that they were allegedly shouting Jimmy Savile shows that Boris Johnson's words have real-life consequences. Yeah, well, as I said, I've listened to the whole tape, and they did mention Jimmy Savile, that is true. That was, they also spent most of the time when they were harassing uh, poor Keir Starmer there, talking about Julian Assange, lockdown, goodness knows what else. And the same people that were harassed, some of the same people who were harassing and intimidating Keir Starmer had done the same thing to Michael Gove and to BBC journalist Nick Watts. These are people who've got a, I'm afraid, sadly, a track record of behaving in that appalling way to, towards public So figures. those are three leaders who I've told you who disagree, not just Labour, SNP and Lib Dems. This was uh, Julian Smith MP uh, last night. What happened to Keir Starmer tonight outside Parliament is appalling. Uh, is what he said. Yeah, well, it he was went... appalling. It was appalling. Um, it and he went on to say it's really important for our democracy and for his security that the false Savile slurs made against him are withdrawn in full. Not just him. We also heard from Tobias Elwood last night, and this is what uh, Tobias Elwood was saying. Mm. Apologise, please. We claim to be the mother of all parliaments. Let's stop this drift towards a Trumpian style of politics from becoming the norm. We are better than this. Yeah, and that is why last week the Prime Minister clarified very clearly, as your, clip, as, your, as your clip showed, good enough. That, he wasn't, that he wasn't suggesting that Keir Starmer personally took decisions about Jimmy Savile. But the CPS, which he ran, overall did have organisational failings, and that's what he was pointing to. Um, I've just illustrated with at least seven people who are all senior uh, members mm. of whatever the party they're a member of, all unite to say, Prime Minister, you need to apologise. Yeah. Well, 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 I've heard those comments and, you know, I've said that he, he clarified... Are they all that he clarif that he, Look, he clarified his comments... They've heard his cl clarification. He clarified it's his comments last week to make clear what he meant. And I think and the Prime Minister came out yesterday and very clearly said yesterday evening that what happened to Keir Starmer, that her terrible harassment and intimidation, is completely unacceptable. Uh, whether it's the leader of the opposition, whether it's Michael Gove, whether it's journalists like Nick Watt, it just should not be happening on our streets, and I'm glad that the police have made arrests as a result. We haven't met before, Minister, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot here, but you are defending the indefensible. No, well, I don't think so. I've explained how the Prime Minister clarified what he said. He, he went back on the record a couple of days after he made the initial remarks to make sure there was no misunderstanding, because the thing he said, I think it was Monday of last week, the, the first clip you played in Parliament, could have been misconstrued as suggesting that Keir Starmer personally took a decision. Those are the slur, online slurs that Keir Starmer himself referred to. And the Prime Minister, quite rightly, came back and clarified that is not what he meant. Uh, he was talking about the general responsibility for the organisation, not the any specific personal involvement. So he went back and he rightly clarified that within a couple of days to make sure there was no misunderstanding. The second most important person in government, his next-door neighbour, also said that he would not have said it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did say that, that's right. OK. Um, everybody, apart from the Prime Minister, and it would seem you today, uh, feel that it, it, we, the uh, leader of the opposition deserves an apology. Hmm. Well, I mean, the Chancellor didn't, didn't say he deserves an apology. He said that he wouldn't personally um, have said it, and people make their own choices about what to say. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at his clarification... Do you think he was right to say it? Look, I mean, it's his choice to make the comment that he made um, in the heat of the debate. Uh, he clarified 
a couple of days later exactly what he meant. But there is no way anyone reasonably can suggest that what he said incited or justified or I'm prompted... I'm just giving you a, a list yeah. of people who do think that, that it well, is reasonable to make that I, I don't think I don't think you can make the leap from commenting on someone's record as DPP um, or, or commenting on what happened at the DPP while he was in charge of it, um, being clear that it wasn't him personally who took the decision on Jimmy Savile, um, to harassment and intimidation. So, just to clarify, the Mayor of London, the leader of um, the Scottish Nationals, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, a very senior Conservative who used to be a minister uh, and a chief whip, and the uh, chairman of the Defence Select Committee are all wrong. Yeah, I just don't think you can, you can say that the comments the Prime Minister made about Keir wrong. Starmer's record as DPP or the, or the Crown Prosecution Service's record can, can reasonably be said to have prompted the terrible harassment and intimidation that we just saw. People get, have their record criticised the whole time. Right? People criticise the Prime Minister's record the whole time. Politicians get criticised the whole time. And you don't sort of say, well, that justifies uh, a mob surrounding the politician in the way that we just saw. Oh, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying to you. What I'm saying to you is, are all of these people that I've quoted to you who feel so strongly about it that they actually put it into writing on Twitter last night, are they all wrong? Yeah, look, I, as I said, I don't think you can make a link reasonably so between wrong. what the Prime Minister said and the harassment and intimidation. This group of people there were talking about a number of things beyond, as well as Jimmy Savile. They're people who have harassed other public figures, including journalists, over the last uh, year or two. Um, so I don't think you can make that link. And when it came to the journalists and when it came to other people that they were harassing, did they mention Jimmy Savile then? Well, they mentioned all kinds of things, they as they did last Jimmy night. Did they mention Jimmy Savile then? Well, no, because that wasn't an issue at the time. But, they, exactly. but, but, the, but the harassment... Exactly. But the, hang on, Kate, the harassment last night, they were talking about a whole number of things. They, were talking about, they mostly talked about Julian Assange. If you listen to the entire clip, they were mostly going on about Julian Assange for some reason. They were harassing the leader of Her Majesty's yeah. opposition. Which is the totally extent, unacceptable. To the totally extent unacceptable. where he needed to get police mm. protection. He needed to be whisked off in a police vehicle. They talked to him about Jimmy Savile, mm. um, and that was brought up by the Prime Minister at the dispatch box last week. The, uh, Deputy, the um, Shadow Foreign Secretary caught up in the melee as well. Several people from all uh, persuasions of Parliament and up in Scotland as well, and the Mayor of London all saying this is unacceptable and it's a direct result of what happened with the Prime Minister's comments on Jimmy Savile and he needs to apologise. Well, I agree with and you. Well, I, 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 you are defending the indefensible. Acceptable. There is no way the Leader of the Opposition or, or any MP in public life, or indeed anyone at all, including journalists, should suffer the kind of intimidation and harassment that Keir Starmer uh, suffered on the clip that you're, you're showing. No way that should happen. It's totally wrong. However, I don't think you can say that that was caused by the Prime Minister's comments, because these people, because it. these people, all these other people are saying. Well, I don't think I'm not saying. Well, it. I don't think they should say it either, because the people who are, who undertook that terrible intimidation and harassment are people who've got a long track record of doing exactly the same thing. They've been doing that long before the Prime Minister made a reference to Jimmy Savile. They've been case, doing it to people for in months, which case, if not years. If the Prime Minister didn't think he was wrong, why did he clarify the situation in Blackpool? Well, he clarified the situation because I think the comments he made the previous Monday were capable of being potentially misinterpreted as meaning that Keir Starmer had individually somehow been involved in that case. So which he was which is not, which is not, yeah, which, which is not true. He wasn't. And there, there have been online uh, slurs, as Keir Starmer so said, he was wrong to, to that say effect. What, the, what he said could have been misinterpreted that way, and that is why he came out in Blackpool in the second clip you played very clearly saying that... He's not. He was not suggesting, and does not suggest, okay. that Keir Starmer personally got involved in that. But he obviously was responsible for the CPS as a whole, and Keir Starmer himself subsequently apologised for the CPS's failings in this area. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the online safety bill, which is why you're here today. Mm. I'm sure my viewers have their own views on what happened last night. Mm. Uh, robust age verification measures is what being told about the bill. Will that go far enough? Yes, it will. This is a huge um, step forward to uh, protect children. We are very worried about the way that large numbers of children uh, access uh, pornography, sometimes extreme pornography. Uh, I think 51% of 11 to 13-year-olds uh, have accessed uh, porn online, which is of enormous concern to parents. We think that is completely wrong. And the measures we're going to be introducing to Parliament shortly in the updated online safety bill will impose an absolute obligation uh, on companies, all companies, carrying pornography, whether it's uh, user-generated content on social media or commercial pornography sites, it'll cover everything. 
will be required to make sure uh, people under the age of 18, uh, children, cannot access pornography. It'll be the first time in this country we've legislated in that way. Uh, and we know parents will welcome this, the police will welcome it, teachers will welcome it. I think it's a massive step forward uh, for protecting our children. OK. Um, we've been talking about it for a decade, not likely to come in until about 2025. Uh, why is it taking so long? Well, there, there were some provisions in the Digital Economy Act about four years ago, three years ago, um, but those didn't go far enough. They didn't cover, for example, social media platforms, which obviously is a huge source of um, pornography that children end up looking at. So we decided we needed to go a lot further and cover all forms of uh, online pornography. Which this, so we took the opportunity of updating it in this new bill. We intend to introduce this new bill to Parliament in the coming weeks. Uh, we hope it will have very broad-based uh, cross-party support. We'll get it through Parliament as quickly as we possibly can. I hope this calendar year through both houses and then get it implemented uh, as quickly after that as we can. So it's a huge step forward to protect children. I think 80% of adults support the idea of age verification. That is to say, making sure that people under 18 can't see pornography. So there's huge public support for this. And, uh, you know, we've seen stories about uh, sexual harassment, sexual assaults in schools increasing in recent years. Part of the reason for that, the police think, is the exposure uh, of pornography to children. And that's why it's so important that we take this like very firm step to make sure they just can't see this sort of material online under the age of 18. OK, I'm a pussycat, really. So let's... Can I play some music to finish? If you'd like to. Here yeah. we go. <laughs> it's a bit unexpected. I, I, will. Will. Here we go. I like this song. I, I do like it, actually, yeah. OK. The Prime Minister likes it, apparently. So I hear. Yeah, he sang it to his new head of comms. So I hear. Yeah. Do you think he's taking the mickey out of all of us? No, I don't. I think it was a, a moment of lightness in what was obviously quite a stressful time um, for a lot of people in public life. And I don't think we should uh, criticise somebody for a moment of levity during uh, what is probably quite a stressful working day. Mm, it's not in his gift, though, is it, really, whether he survives or not? Well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I, I hope and expect that he will. And I don't think we should, as I say, we don't criticise someone for, for having a moment of, of lightness. I think in everybody's working day, I hope, including yours, there are moments of lightness in what can be quite a stressful Yes, there life. are. What about you? Not coming on this show, I bet. I have, yes. Well, <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I'll need to be singing after this. Um, but, look, I mean, I, I don't sing, generally, but uh, except in the shower. Um, but everyone needs, needs a way, I think, of... of Letting off steam. I mean, yeah. all of us, I think, in different ways, have yeah. quite stressful working lives. Yeah. You know, Trust live... me, you wouldn't want me to sing. There we I are. couldn't well, carry a no, tune. No, I think you should. In I think bucket. you should. I could oh, not on. carry a tune in a bucket. Go Maybe. On. I remember Alok Sharma agreeing to do Islands in the Stream with me at karaoke at Christmas and, once. And did you? Uh, thankfully for everybody, the pandemic happened. You didn't keep your, you didn't <laughs> keep your pledge. I can't believe it. <laughs> Maybe next year with you. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Thanks very Thank much, you. for coming in. Thank you. Look at the front pages for you this morning, starting with The Guardian newspaper. Uh, that leading with criticism of the Prime Minister for his comments to Sakir Starmer about Jimmy, Siv uh, Jimmy Savile. Forgive me, after the Labour leader was confronted by angry protesters outside the House of Commons. It's the same story for the Metro. Their headline, Kia flees hate mob. Likewise, the I, which reads, Police rescue Starmer from mob as PM faces crunch 48 hours. While the Express quotes Boris Johnson maintaining that he and Rishi Sunak are a united front after rumours the Chancellor wants his job. Away from those troubles, the Prime Minister writes for The Times, insisting Britain will not flinch over the possibility of conflict in Ukraine. A reminder uh, that uh, on Thursday, 9 o'clock, joined in the studio by the Education Secretary, Nadeem Zahawi, who will be answering your questions. You can tweet the questions you want to uh, put to him. Actually, we've had thousands, literally thousands already. But if you've got a burning question uh, you would like to put to the Education Secretary, then do get in touch. He should have been with us yesterday. Recovering from COVID, he's much, much better. One of his first decisions is to come and talk to you, lovely lot, on our programme on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. Meantime, breaking news in the last few moments. The oil giant BP has just published its latest results. Our business correspondent, Helen Ann, is here. What are they saying? Uh, morning, Kay. So, yeah, the annual results uh, from BP for the year, for last year, 2021. Profits uh, of £12.8 billion. Wow. Big, really big. Uh, bigger, uh, certainly, than it was in 2020, but there was a big drop in oil prices in 2020, bigger than it was prior to the pandemic as well. Now, it's set to be quite controversial this morning, and you might ask why it's not particularly controversial normally for large companies to make big profits. 
but it will be controversial mm -hmm. today because the very forces that are driving these big profits for BP, that soaring wholesale price of oil and gas that we've been hearing so much about, is the very forces that are driving a lot of families into desperately, desperately Real difficult poverty, times yeah. at the moment. Exactly that, Kay. We heard just last week, didn't we, that the off-gem price cap, that's the, the price sort of limit, if you like, that the regulator puts on energy bills to try and protect vulnerable customers. We heard last week, because this price is soaring so high, that cap has to go up. It's going up by 54%. It means about £700, roughly, on average, per household extra every single year. And, it, you know, it's really dire for a lot of families. Predictions of something like a quarter of households now heading into fuel poverty. Very, very serious. So a lot of people will be asking, in this circumstance, is it ethical? Is it right that essentially the seller of that wholesale oil and gas, BP and others, are making uh, such large profits? Some of the language as well has been really controversial, Kay. The, uh, the, the boss of BP describing the business as a cash machine recently, which I think some people have said is, is deeply insensitive given the uh, situation that we're all in. It will definitely heighten calls for what's been called a windfall tax. That's something Labour want to see. Essentially, a one-off tax on these big profits. Okay. Use some of that money to help poorer families. But there's lots of controversial, difficult things about that as well. BP lost a lot of money last year. They say that the only people to lose from that are their shareholders, mainly of whom are actually pension funds. So it, it is complicated. OK. But certainly a lot of discussion on this today, I, I think. I know you're going to get lots of re reaction for us, but for now, thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Uh, still to come on the programme for this hour is the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie Johnson, a victim of misogyny. I'll be discussing that with Ash Sarka and Scotty Nell Hughes in just a few moments. We'll have more on the government's plans to legally force pornographic websites to check the age of users. The new normal, speaking to an etiquette expert about how some of us working from home are boosting our images on Zoom. Boris Johnson's warned President Putin that invading Ukraine would only strengthen NATO. It comes as President Putin has warned European countries that they will be drawn into military conflict if Ukraine joins NATO following his meeting with the, a French... Well, not really a meeting, was it? With a French President Emmanuel Macron yesterday, may as well have stayed in Paris. If Ukraine would be in NATO and tries to retake Crimea militarily... European countries will automatically be drawn into military conflict with Russia. Of course, NATO's armament potential and Russia's are not comparable, and we understand that. But we also understand that Russia is one of the leading nuclear powers and ahead of many in its modernity. There will be no winners. Alex, standing by for us now in Kiev. Hi, um, Alex. So we've heard what Macron has been up to, speaking to the Russians. Meantime, our Prime Minister is uh, waving his finger from the sidelines. Uh, that's right. He is warning uh, President Putin of the catastrophic nature of an invasion if he does decide uh, that course of action. He is also saying that uh, uh, the UK and NATO ally allies will bolster uh, their allies in Eastern uh, Europe. So uh, he's kind of basically saying to President Putin, the stakes are extremely high. If you do do this, it will be an extremely risky course of action that you will pay dearly for, not just with sanctions, but you'll also give a, a raison d'etre uh, for NATO as well, a reason for it to continue and to uh, fortify itself. All of the things that President Putin, of course, is trying to stop uh, from happening as he kind of tries to rearrange the furniture of the sort of European uh, security architecture that was negotiated after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. But, of course, the diplomacy continues. President Macron is uh, on his way here. He's probably arrived by now. He's due at the presidential palace for his meeting with President uh, Zelensky in the next uh, couple of hours also, and I'm sure he will appraise the president of that marathon meeting that he had with Putin. Unusual, not just in terms of its length, about five hours, but uh, also for the fact that no aides were present. But all the time, of course, the spectre of an invasion remains. Those 130,000 troops still massed on the border. OK, Alex, thank you. Uh, West Ham United footballer Kurt Zuma says he is deeply sorry after pictures emerged of him kicking more than kicking, his pet cat across his kitchen floor on Sunday. 
these are the images on the front of the Sun newspaper. It was filmed by his brother. They put it up on social media. He was slapping his cat in the face in this video that was obtained by the son. His brother believed to have filmed the incident, as he said, inside the defender's home before posting it to Snapchat. How stupid is that? A day after Zuma appeared for West Ham in the FA Cup. Well, uh, Ivor standing by for us now with more information. Hi, Ivor. I mean this beggar's belief. Frankly, uh, bizarre. We're not going to show the full video, um, but we are going to show some still frames from it, which I should warn that some viewers might find upsetting. Kurt Zuma can be seen dropping his cat and kicking it with quite some force across his kitchen floor, like a goalkeeper would do after picking up the ball. Um, he's also seen, the West Ham star is also seen chasing his cat around his house, hurling shoes at it, even at one point slapping it in the face, again really quite forcefully. All the while laughter can be heard in the background of this video. It was filmed on Sunday, uploaded to Snapchat and since then the former Chelsea player has issued a grovelling statement, quite a lengthy one. He says... I want to apologise for my actions. There are no excuses for my behaviour, which I sincerely regret. I also want to say how deeply sorry I, sorry I am to anyone who was upset by the video. I would like to assure everyone that our two cats are perfectly fine and healthy. They are loved and cherished by our entire family. And this behaviour was an isolated incident that will not happen again. Now, his club, West Ham, have publicly condemned his actions and the footage, though, and have vowed to investigate this internally RSPCA have also spoken out against it so I think there could well be some repercussions to come. Okay do we know where the cat is? Uh, we don't but according to Kurt Zuma it's alive and well still in his house but as I say uh, some potential repercussions because the RSPCA have said they may well investigate if they uh, receive any complaints. Makes my blood boil this sort of stuff. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot Ivor. Cats this big he is a professional footballer and he boots it across the kitchen, allegedly, and his brother thinks it's so funny, not only does he take the video, but he then posts it on Snapchat because they think they've done nothing wrong, allegedly. Uh, let's look at some of today's other headlines for you now. OK, this is literally the craziest thing I've ever seen. This plane is parked at the gate and the wind is so bad here in Iceland that it's just rocking back and forth. Tragic story about a professional skateboarder, Josh Newman, among four men killed when their sightseeing plane crashed into a lake in Iceland. More than a thousand search and rescue personnel helped hunt for the aircraft when it disappeared from radar. MPs are calling on big companies to publish data on whether employees from ethnic minorities are paid less than their white colleagues. The chair of the Women and Equalities Committee said there was a clear impetus to report disparities. Now, a slightly stranger sport and uh, take a quick look at this. Oh, show off. That's taking doing a plank to a whole new level, isn't it? It's Kai Sandmeyer from Germany. He set a new world record for hula hooping while planking. <laughs> Six minutes and 34 seconds he held his plank for, almost double the previous record. For the attempt to count, he had to be filmed from several angles with two witnesses present and he had to do it all in public. You've got to give it to him, haven't you? That's amazing. Now, the Brit Awards return to London's O2 Arena tonight with a star-studded lineup of live performances. It's a battle of the old guard versus the rising stars of the pop world this year as the likes of Adele and Ed Sheeran look to fend off competition from a newer, politically charged wave of talent. Our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer reports. It's been six years since Adele last left the Brit Awards, clutching armfuls of trophies. Now she's back. <laughs> 30 might have been the best-selling album of last year, but can her brand of popular pop I need a thing, 30 plus, really beat the politics of rapper Dave? Like Joy Crooks, who's up for two Brits, says artists should be saying something meaningful. When Sue Gray's busy, so am I. There are artists that have always written about what's going on around them. Stars who are attending this year's Brits will notice some big changes. Who gets one of these has changed this year. And so non-binary artists like Sam Smith aren't excluded. There's no best male, no best female. Instead, 
to address criticism that they've had in recent years, that they aren't reflecting what young people are actually listening to. This year, there's four new categories. Alternative rock act. Dance act. You can't short me one. Best hip hop, grime, rap act. And pop R&B. Although fans are a little riled that no R&B singers actually made the shortlist. Out of those categories, organisers are hoping to stay relevant by letting TikTok users vote for who wins. And TikTok is how A1 and J1 found fame, whilst one of them was still at school during the pandemic. When I put on TikTok and it was getting the reception it was getting, I was like, this is this has never happened to me before. Like this is crazy. Like new host Mo Gilligan expects he'll still have to do some wrangling. If anyone comes to your party, like I tell you where you can get the Wi-Fi and the charger, but hey, if you're sick in the toilet, you gotta clean it up, innit? It's your mess. <laughs> Bad habits sleep to late night. In a strong year for music, we'll find out tonight whether politics or pop wins out. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Oh, got to love a bit of Ed Sheeran first thing in the morning, haven't you? Now, it's also a big day in the world of film today. The 2022 Oscar nominations are announced later and it could be the first time that a Netflix movie wins the Best Picture Prize with Power of the Dog. Currently, the book is favourite to win and there's a big British contingent in the running for the top acting award this year, including Benedict Cumberbatch, Andrew Garfield and, of course, Olivia Colman. But the Oscars have had their limelight stolen already as the Razzies, that's the Golden Raspberry Awards for the biggest cinematic failures of the year, have released their nominations already in this characteristically bizarre video announcement. And it's not good news for Bruce Willis, who, according to the Razzies team, has been in so many bad films in one year that he has his own category. Worst performance by Bruce Willis in a 2021 movie. A quick look at the weather. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. A band of rain through central parts separating the cold, blustery north from the milder south. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. A Banksy mural is to be removed from its home in Wales and taken to a secure location after attempts by fanatics to damage... The artwork, I think they're trying to take a little bit of it rather than damaging it. Season's greetings drew plenty of attention when it first appeared on the outside of a steel worker's priv uh, private garage in Port Talbot in December of 2018. And it eventually had to be fenced off. It depicts a message about the impact of pollution on communities and shows a child appearing to play in the snow, certainly holding his arms up as it starts to snow, but it turns out to be falling ash and smoke from a skip fire, as you can see. Taken to a secure place for protection. Coming up, is the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie Johnson, a victim of misogyny? We'll have more on that in just a few moments' time. Hi, everyone. A very good morning to you. Welcome to The Breakfast Programme on Sky. The Technology Minister has defended Boris Johnson over spreading claims about Zakir Starmer, saying that last night's confrontation with a mob was not due to the PM's comments about Jimmy Savile. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has warned Europe over enlarging NATO, but Boris Johnson says Britain won't flinch. West Ham United footballer Kurt Zuma has said he is deeply sorry after pictures emerged of him kicking his cat across his kitchen floor. Let's talk about Chris Philp, should we? He has uh, condemned last night's shocking scenes in Westminster when the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, was pursued by a mob hurling abuse at him about the paedophile Jimmy Savile. But Mr Philp defended the Prime Minister and told this programme that the confrontation was not because of Boris Johnson's comments in the Commons. Several party leaders and senior Tories are claiming Boris Johnson fuelled it, saying words have an impact. I don't think you can say that's why it happened because some of the people involved in that um, that fracas you showed a second ago, you know that they were saying have, have previously, you know they were talking have, about have previously done similar things to people like Michael Gove and BBC journalist uh, Nick Watt. Did I've they listened to Jim I've listened then? I've no. listened to the whole tape. I've yeah, listened so to the whole I. tape, 
And they did mention Jimmy Savile. They did mention that. They also mentioned Julian Assange repeatedly. They mentioned uh, COVID. They mentioned the opposition more generally. And so I don't think you can point uh, to what the Prime Minister said as the cause of that. You certainly can't blame him for the fact um, that mob were clearly behaving in a totally unacceptable way. It's going to haunt him, isn't it? So another minister coming out having to defend the Prime Minister's behaviour, this time um, over those Jimmy Savile comments from last week, which, as Chris Phelps said, the Prime Minister has clarified, saying that he doesn't think Keir Starmer was directly responsible for the decision not to prosecute Jimmy Savile. He just headed the organisation um, that, had, uh, that had been involved in it. But... He did not apologise. We now have, as far as I can tell, 10 Conservatives on record criticising the Prime Minister over those comments. Um, Julian Smith, former Cabinet Minister, saying it's appalling, it's a problem for democracy. A newly elected MP, Robert Largan, who, as far as I can see, has not been critical of the Prime Minister much before, uh, saying that these words echo beyond Parliament. So you do wonder if the Prime Minister, who, for now, number 10, tell me, he's standing by what he said last night, all forms of harassment are appalling, no one should be harassed but isn't going any further than that, you do wonder if that line is going to hold. OK, we'll see. Uh, tomorrow's take at 9 yeah. o'clock. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much indeed. Well, as Boris Johnson has faced mounting criticism over his conduct in recent weeks, so too has his wife, Carrie. She's been accused of having too much influence at number 10, but she says she's been the target of a brutal briefing campaign by her husband's enemies. Um, the health secretary, Sajid Javid, said recent comments made about Carrie in a biography written by the Tory peer Lord Ashcroft were misogynistic and sexist. So what on earth is going on? Joining us to discuss it is Ash Sarkar, a contributing editor at Navora Media and the political commentator and journalist Scotty Nell Hughes. Let's go to you, Ash, first of all, if I may. Um, what do you make of what's going on? I think we have to take some of the Ashcroft claims with a hefty pinch of salt. His party piece is writing these books, which have got enough salacious details in them that it effectively torpedoes the reputation of a prime minister. We saw that with his book, Call Me Dave, with that memorable story about David Cameron and allegations of what happened with a dead pig's head. What matters is less whether or not those claims are true and more about whether or not they emerge into a context where people want to believe them. And I think with these claims about Carrie Johnson, what's clear is that people want to believe these claims because the prime minister's authority, his sense that he takes his responsibilities for the operation of Downing Street seriously, are in absolute tatters. OK, uh, let's bring in Nell, uh, Nell should we? Um, Scotty, let's call you Scotty, um, as we normally do. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you for staying up, as always. We really appreciate it. Do uh, first ladies find themselves in a similar position? Are they a target too? Well, absolutely. And political wives have this impossible set of expectations, whether you're talking about Melania Trump all the way to Hillary Clinton, and depending on how much involvement they want to have in their husband's political roles. But make no mistake to say that a wife, if it is a good partnership, a good marriage, that she does not have influence is absolutely naive. And I think they actually damaged the credibility when the statement was put out that she plays no role in government. I think that's insulting. I think if it is a good, healthy, newlywed marriage, uh, that absolutely she has his ear, she is able to advise him because that is what a partnership is. And But realize the only reason that we're facing this criticism right now of Carrie to the amount that we are is because her husband is unpopular. Uh, they, while there has been some in the past, this is mainly being used as a political weapon to hurt him. It's less about her and her actions. They're just the, those that are trying to, to call Boris Johnson out for his actions and his irresponsibility in handling different situations these past few months are using her to hurt him. Whether it works or not, I don't know. But this idea that it's misogynistic, I think that's a question. The only reason that may bring sexism into this issue is that you don't see the same type of criticism for the spouses who are male of politicians, whether it be American or British. We don't see any criticism of the second gentleman. In fact, you very rarely hear anything about Douglas Imhoff here in the United States. So that is the only place where I think sexism plays the rules. But make no mistake, this is more about the actions of Boris Johnson and the criticism he's facing and just being his wife being used as a tool against him rather than her actions herself. What do you think on that, um, Ash? I mean, to that point, we certainly never heard much uh, criticism about Mr May, did we? I think the only thing we knew about him was that he took the bins out. 
I mean, we didn't hear much criticism of Dennis Thatcher, who was famous for spending more time with his golf clubs than he did at Downing Street, or indeed uh, Philip May. Um, but I, I would err um, on the side of caution here before making big sweeping statements, because, of course, you did have, under New Labour, the husbands of female cabinet ministers coming under fire. Uh, there was a famous expenses story, I think, involving the husband of Jackie Smith, if I recall correctly. Uh, and that was an instance where a female politician's husband was used to damage her reputation. The thing I would also encourage us to do is think about the specifics of this situation. Because Carrie Johnson, yes, I do think that some of these criticisms are motivated by misogyny, but she is also a political operator in her own right. She had a political career before she became involved with Boris Johnson. And it does seem that some aspect of that has continued since they've been married. One of the core allegations around Partygate is that she hosted what was essentially a victory party in the Downing Street flat, celebrating the departure of Dominic Cummings, who she considered to be her political opponent within the Downing Street operation. There was also the hire of Allegra Stratton in that Prime Minister's spokesperson role. Uh, she was considered to be a close friend of Carrie Johnson. So I think that here's where we get to the sticky point, which is, yes, I do think that the spouses, the partners of Prime Ministers can come under undue scrutiny. But in this instance, you also have Carrie Johnson operating as her own political actor. And we don't have the normal methods of holding her accountable the same way we would a minister or a SPAD or somebody who is employed by the prime minister. And I think that that's why the coverage has taken this more hostile tone. OK. Um, and, Scotty, I mean, we, we do see um, first ladies that actually really quite fancy the top job as well, don't we? If we look back, not that far in history. Absolutely. And here we have to recognize this. That's probably one of the reasons why Boris Johnson fell in love with Carrie in the first place was her activism, the fact that he could hold that type of conversation with her. So it's just a natural role for them together to play as a partner, which in reality looks good. Look at Bill and Hillary Clinton. And a lot of people say that she actually was the good, the more serious side when it came to his ruling when he was here in the United States, and hence why she could launch her own presidential campaign following. So the same things that she's being criticized for might be one of the main reasons why Boris first was attracted to her and has built this relationship with her is because of her knowledge and her activism. So it would be quite natural for her to continue into that role, not only as an activist, but as the first first lady of Great Britain. OK, good to talk to both of you, ladies. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Now, under new online safety rules, websites that publish pornographic material will be legally required to verify users are over the age of 18. Joining us now is Nafi Diop, the Chief of the Gender and Human Rights Branch at the United Nations Population Fund. Hello to you. Thank you for joining us um, on the programme this morning. Um, we all want, of course, a safer internet. Do you think that we are heading in the right direction? Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I think so because there is more and more governments actually uh, recognizing that there is an issue here and that the online world is a new frontier for gender-based violence and something must be done. So uh, UNFPA has launched a, a campaign, a body right campaign, uh, actually to bring attention and awareness on that particular issue of online violence because nearly 40% of uh, women have experienced it personally, and it has real life repercussion. And what exactly is online violence? Online violence is actually using the internet space uh, and uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, really um, uh, abuse actually uh, women and girls. It's targeting mostly, uh, you know, uh, women and girls globally. But there is, of course, some uh, groups that are more vulnerable to online violence. Uh, for example, uh, women, girls, ethnic minorities, LGBTQI uh, community often face the most abuse things. Young people who spend most time online are also especially vulnerable to uh, that kind of uh, violence. And it's a violation of human rights. It is typically highly sexualized and range from online harassment to blackmail and exploitation. OK. Uh, it's so good of you to take the time to explain that to us this morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Lyon this morning. Merci bien. 
Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Fantastic backdrop there, wasn't it, as she was talking to us? And as hybrid working appears to be here to stay for many of us, research suggests some staff working from home have started using clever ruses to make themselves look busier than they really are on Zoom. Let's talk about it, should we? Joining us um, to maybe try and give us an idea about how to convince our bosses uh, online that we know what we're talking about is etiquette expert William Hansen. Hi, William. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us on the programme. What are your top tips? Well, I think the, the first one is don't sit too close. And this is particularly true if you have a laptop rather than a desktop, is that there is a temptation to sit really close to it. And all the research shows that actually what that does is when you appear on the other person's screen or other people's screen, is it triggers the other people's amygdala, the part of our brain that makes us want to, oh, step back and disappear because we do feel that you have in, entered our personal space. Just as if I came up to you in real life and stood really close to you, your amygdala would be triggered and you would want to step back. And it gives, on Zoom, it can still trigger the amygdala and give you that sort of the other person, the sense of uh, threat that you, you are coming too close. So try to sit back with, with as much space around you as possible without it looking like you're uh, sitting the other side of the room. And what about, I'm not sure if you can see us this morning, what about if you're trying to be very cerebral and so, you know, I sort of put my glasses on and I've got the bookcase behind me, is that just trying too hard? Well, if, look, if that is your backdrop uh, and that's a genuine backdrop, it's fine. Uh, but if you have sort of put one of these sort of uh, fancy backdrops on to make it look like you're somewhere else, uh, you know, the one that really irritates me is when you see people uh, with the Golden Gate Bridge behind them, for example, they're clearly not sitting in San Francisco. It's, it's a fake backdrop. Uh, we don't need it. Uh, but if it is, if you have got a bookcase behind you, that's fine. Glasses you've got to be careful with, though, on Zoom because, of course, you have to completely focus on, as you should be, on what yeah, the, the meeting that you are in. Because if you're sort of scrolling through windows and different things are appearing, often people can see the other windows in your glasses and sort of the game is up that you're not focusing on them. But what about if I'm trying to pretend that I'm on um, holiday? What about then? Uh, well, um, look, you shouldn't really, you know, this, this research also shows that people are answering calls on, on pelotons and exercise bikes uh, to show that they're productive. Similarly, if you're answering a call when you're on holiday, well, fair enough, your choice, your holiday. Um, but perhaps you're not going to be focusing that much on what's going on. And with any meeting in real life or on Zoom, you need to focus on the people uh, that are there. OK, I'm going to put my glasses back on, I think. I think this makes me look quite cerebral, actually. There we go. And I'm in a TV studio as well, so this is my sort of setting now, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to, I suppose you have to be quite careful as well for people to focus, as you were saying, on you as opposed to what's going on in, in the background. And it, it depends who your audience is. Exactly. And I'm sure we, we've probably all uh, slightly changed where we've done uh, Zooms from over the last two years based on who we are speaking to. And I think actually f for etiquette coaches like me, it's been interesting to sort of see the change in etiquette over the last two years. And initially, sort of in March and April 2020, I and, and others were saying, you know, you don't really comment on uh, anything that you can see. You try and have as plain a background as possible. But I think then it, it quickly changed because we weren't going into people's homes, socially or professionally. We were confined to our own home. And actually, we were so used to doing video calls a year, two years later, that really now for small talk, especially when you're waiting for people to connect uh, others on the call, anything that you can see in someone's background is fair game to use for polite, civil positive uh, small talk. So if you can see it, you can talk about it. Whereas if I didn't want you to see it or know it was there, I would, of course, change my background. Yeah, I once interviewed um, uh, the, the would-be uh, US president, former first lady, of course, Hillary Clinton. Um, and sh we both agreed that oh, we looked very proper from here, but we both had our uh, sloppy joes on underneath. <laughs> Is that acceptable? Uh, well, it all goes on. Uh, my, my suggestion is no, because you never know what might happen. A mouse might run in the room, the laptop might fall down, someone might come to the door, you suddenly need to get up. Uh, and, and then the game is up and then all your sort of professional image has been quashed. And for the extra 30 seconds uh, it takes to put on some, you know, trousers or a, something that matches the, the top half, uh, I think it's probably not worth it. But look, if it's good enough for um, you know, the former Secretary of State of America, then that's fine. Uh, there we go. And what about when... Um, is there a polite way of telling people that they're on mute? I'm, <laughs> all day, every day, <laughs> I say to my team, you're on mute. 
Uh, yeah, well, I, you can on Zoom, if you're the host of a meeting, you can request that somebody unmutes. I think that's sort of a, a slightly less passive aggressive way uh, to do it than sort of rather, uh, yes, uh, forlornly saying you're on mute still. Uh, but hopefully this will change as people get even more used to Zoom. But that said, we've had two years of asking if people are, could take themselves off mute. So maybe it won't change. Maybe that bit yeah. is here to stay. And what about, finally, before I let you go, what about the, uh, the, the social um, appropriateness of not having your camera on? Oh, no, I think, no, if, if you're, especially if you're invited to a Zoom, you know, the, there is part of the, the given is that you are going to be in vision and not having it on or blurring your background, perhaps, sort of is, is more suspicious, I think, uh, than if you just sort of uh, have your camera on or show something in the background. I think if you wanted a just an audio only call, pick up the phone. But Zoom is, by and large, it's a video call. I co couldn't agree with you more. Hope you're having a lovely holiday and uh, hopefully we'll see you very soon. Thank you very much indeed for your Thank top you. tips. Always much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Locke. Very quick chat um, with um, Tamara while we're here. Um, what did you make of what the Minister had to say this morning, Tamara? Good well, morning. Very strong defence of Boris Johnson saying that he cannot be blamed for what happened between Keir Starmer and those protesters last night, the very ugly scenes where he was mobbed by anti-vax protesters uh, shouting at one point about Jimmy Savile. Now, the point that Chris Philp, the minister, made is that these protesters have been around Westminster for a few months now, protesting mainly about anti-vax protests and they have, were shouting about um, Julian Assange and various other things and so he was making the point that perhaps they would have seized on anything and they have intimidated journalists and other politicians including Conservatives but we now have 10 Tories on the record saying the Prime Minister needs to apologise and take responsibility for the comments he made and the impact they have outside Westminster. Yeah. Yes, many of those are people who criticised the Prime Minister before but um, the pressure seems to be building on the Prime Minister to not just clarify his comments but to apologize for them okay more to come in just a few moments here on sky news distinction